I know you're out there. I know you're looking for something. You're looking for meaning in the Matrix Trilogy. But what if I told you the rabbit hole was never that deep? The Matrix is a 1999 sci-fi action film directed by Lana and Lily Wachowski, renowned for its use of cutting-edge technology and explosive action to explore some surprisingly profound ideas. This was a time when computers and the internet were becoming part of mainstream culture, even though technological literacy hadn't necessarily caught up yet, as evidenced by the fact that Wachowski's only know like four computer terms. You got mainframe, program, code, and of course, virus. Concepts like reality being part of a computer simulation were just beginning to reach beyond the science fiction subculture. The intersection of societal and technological transformation created an opportune moment for a genre-defining hit. And at the time of its release, The Matrix was a watershed. It was lightning in a bottle, and if you were alive at the time, you remember the impact it had. It was damn near inescapable. Plus, it's the perfect time capsule of the era. If future generations ever want to know what people in 1999 thought was cool, it's right there in all its black leather and rave metal. Then, pack into the Matrix on your computer with a DVD-ROM. Trip into the web. But then, a few years later, we got the sequels, and the reception was... mixed. Critics mostly hated them. Hardcore fans were polarized, with some thinking they were even better than the first film, and others thinking that was dumb and wrong, while the general public just shrugged its collective shoulders and pretty much forgot about them. Ask anyone who's seen the trilogy once or twice what they remember, and they're unlikely to mention anything about the sequels, even though they contain almost all the crucial reveals and plot points of the overall story. They're definitely not likely to remember that there are vampires and werewolves in there somewhere. Big dead ass. In fact, even many who claim to watch these movies religiously focus on elements that are exclusive to the first film, like the simplistic dichotomy of red pill or blue pill. Those who believe they've consumed the former are often getting themselves into some interesting situations. So with the cultural staying power the original has maintained, why are the sequels so often maligned or forgotten? On a second look, it seems the Wachowskis may have fumbled the whole trilogy trying to top the first movie. Bigger, crazier action, more complex philosophical themes, and more nuanced world building that actually convolutes the story to the point of absurdity, all in an attempt to make it seem more complicated than it was ever meant to be. It's about the idea of we take everything for granted. And then other times it feels like it's about hope and love and, and belief. It's about robots versus kung fu. The first Matrix film introduces us to Thomas A. Anderson. By day, he's a mild-mannered programmer for Metacortex. But by night, he's Neo, a hacker with a side hustle selling pirated software. Recently, he's been obsessed with tracking down the infamous computer criminal, Morpheus, who he hopes has the answer to a mysterious question circulating on the deepest, darkest webs. What is the Matrix? Neo ends up finding the answer to his question and is introduced to the real world. But it becomes quickly apparent he's bitten off more than he can chew. Morpheus and most of the crew of his ship, the Nebuchadnezzar, believe Neo is none other than the subject of a prophecy, the one that will bring salvation to Zion an underground city populated by survivors of the machine war, as well as other humans who've taken the red pill. While in the real world, Neo and the rest of his unplugged cohorts are tirelessly pursued by the machines who now dominate the Earth, in the Matrix, they are hunted by agents, security programs designed to secretly police this artificial reality. Q training montage, Q rescue mission, Q fistfight finale, Q rage against the machine, credits roll. For better or worse, The Matrix is as much a product of its time as it is a product of its creator's influences, from which they borrowed heavily. We liked kung fu movies. We liked, we liked Japanimation. We liked Japanimation. We liked, you know, John Wu movies. And... Perhaps none more so than Ghost in the Shell, the seminal 1995 film directed by Mamoru Oshii. Its central influence on The Matrix is clear, both visually and thematically. They showed me this animated uh, Japanese cartoon, and they said, we want to do that for real. And though Ghost in the Shell is much more adept at exploring questions of identity in an artificial age, the Wachowskis managed to capture some incredibly ambitious visuals. And over two decades later, the original Matrix is still a lot of fun. 
Its incorporation of new techniques like bullet time with the tried and true wire work of Hong Kong helped rejuvenate a genre that had gone stale over the last decade. The cook from under siege is back. I'm not even a good cook. The film industry had been going through its own growing pains, incorporating nascent digital technology into its well-worn tool bag of practical effects. The Matrix was a great example on how to synthesize the two. But for whatever reason, its qualities as a well-made film regularly came second to its supposed layers of deeper meaning in a lot of the positive coverage. It quickly gained prestige for being an exceptionally intelligent movie, above the capacity of most moviegoers. This started early on in the film's lifespan, with many of those who read the script seemingly misunderstanding or being generally perplexed by it. As a script, uh, the first 40 or 50 pages were the best 40 or 50 pages I'd ever read. Uh, and then I got very confused. When I first read that script, I went, wow, am I in the Matrix or am I in the real world? Kind of, how do I get my head around all this? I have to say I didn't understand the script. I mean, I understood the script well enough to say I liked it. I had questions forever. I have no idea why people who've read this script of the first Matrix found it confusing. I don't get that at all. There was no shortage of speculation about the film's philosophy, from Gnosticism to nihilism to postmodernism. This presumed conceptual complexity would come to be so exaggerated that an entire industry of books and think pieces sprang up, dedicated to comparing the Matrix with the theories of various philosophers and intellectuals. But despite its references to Baudrillard, the Matrix was at its core a quintessential chosen one hero art. It's a simple story. It probably wouldn't have been as popular if it wasn't. The film does not blur the line between reality and simulation, but rather draws those lines very clearly. The Matrix would always have like a green bias to it, whereas in the real world, we went for a blue bias. It hinges on the choice between the two. Neo's choice to accept the harsh reality of the red pill, opposed by Cypher's choice to return to blissful ignorance. It's essentially proposing this choice to the audience. And while that's more thought-provoking than your average action movie, it's not exactly brain-busting. Certainly not enough to support the Matrix philosophical complex that continues to this day. Okay, so maybe it's not all that deep, but it didn't really need to be. Once it was released, the Matrix was an immediate smash hit that almost instantly became a part of the zeitgeist. Stevens, agent. Simon, a runner. Freeman, 713. I am a sentinel. For what it is, it's hard to do better and the ending is perfect for a one-off, but not content to deliver a thrilling standalone film with enough philosophical sprinkles to set it apart from your lethal weapons is, the Wachowskis apparently had a trilogy in mind. They said, look, we have this trilogy. Um... But these would not be any ordinary sequels. The next two films would be shot concurrently and released alongside an animated film and a video game and an onslaught of product placement all within the same year. Together, these would tell a full epic story, or at least that was the plan. The success of The Matrix would actually come to be topped by the next part of the trilogy, The Matrix Reloaded. Released in May of 2003, it sought to up the ante on both the crowd-pleasing action and the supposedly heady philosophizing, which it did, to its own detriment. To be fair, Reloaded also retains a lot of the first film's positive attributes. It's got some extremely proficient sequences, shot in a way that's rare for Hollywood, especially now. The lead actors went through twice as much martial arts training this time around, and the movie's full of even more stunts that would probably get a production shut down these days. But the urge to one-up the already exaggerated action of the first film leads into cartoonish territory. What has come to be known as the Burly Brawl is widely regarded as the moment when the Matrix jumped the shark, nuked the fridge, resurrected the Palpatine, so to speak. So much so that its infamy spread outside the fan base and into mainstream circles. What really, Mr. Timberlake? <laughs> there is a moment when the fight might still be believable, but more and more Smiths just keep pouring in till you find yourself laughing. And just in case you hadn't cracked yet, the Wachowskis throw in the sound of actual dominoes and bowling pins to really set that time-honored Three Stooges tone. The most shocking part, though, is that they expect us to find Smith intimidating after this. <laughs> uh. 
A similar strategy of escalation was applied to the much lauded metaphysics of the first film, with Reloaded featuring long stretches of overwritten dialogue that appear complex but never reach beyond the depths of the intro to an intro to philosophy class. This approach is personified in the characters whose expository scenes provide some of the most baffling moments, the Oracle, the Merovingian, and the Architect. Perhaps the best written character in the entire trilogy is the Oracle. Neo is introduced to her by Morpheus, who hopes the Oracle will confirm what he believes, that Neo is the one. She feels like she has her own voice and seems well developed for her relatively small role in the movie, where she dashes Morpheus' hopes, informing Neo that, unfortunately, he is not the one. As we all know, she's bluffing, but this serves to ease the pressure of being the chosen one and allows Neo to come into his own. She's only in the film for a few minutes, but her single scene manages to carry a lot of weight. Much of this can be attributed to the standout performance by Gloria Foster, but the Wachowskis seem to know how to strike the right balance between mystical, mysterious fortune teller and real, naturally written character. But in the sequels, they threw that balance right off the scales. She has the same amount of screen time in Reloaded, but it's almost entirely spent on an awkward thesis about the nature of choice. I felt like sitting. I know. You can almost sense the moment when the Wachowskis stopped writing a character and started writing their term paper. And they even managed to undermine the essential message of her presence in the previous movie. Being the one is just like being in love. No one can tell you you're in love, you just know it. Because you're the one. The Oracle of Reloaded is not only used for spoon feeding the themes, but exposition as well, giving us more information about the Matrix universe than we've gotten up to this point. Every time you've heard someone say they saw a ghost or an angel. Wait, what? So is she saying- Every story you've ever heard about vampires, werewolves, or aliens is the system assimilating some program that's doing something they're not supposed to be doing. Wow, yep. Vampires, werewolves, and aliens apparently exist within the Matrix. That's just kind of thrown out there and then we move on, but some do actually show up, I guess. They don't turn into wolves or bats or anything though, so why even mention that? Was this a planned cinematic universe that never got off the ground? This scene continues a trend that begins to emerge and reload it. Extended monologues that take a lot of time to say very little. Old men like me don't bother with making points. Ultimately, this example just serves to take us to the next as the Oracle gives Neo his mission. Rescue the Keymaker from the Merovingian so he can go to the Source and fulfill the Path of the One. Neo follows the Oracle's instructions and goes with Trinity and Morpheus to find the Merovingian, who is holding the Keymaker captive. The Oracle hypes him up to be this very ancient and powerful program, but he has no real purpose in the story other than being a random obstacle to overcome. And to be smarmy and unlikable, which he succeeds at, but it also makes him impossible to take seriously. You can almost feel the Wachowskis telegraphing to Iraq War era Americans like, see how aggressively French this guy is? Isn't he the worst? He decides to withhold the Keymaker because he says Neo doesn't know why he's on this mission in the first place and thus is without information and powerless, which leads him into a heavy-handed diatribe about causality and free will. And again, the characters just start speaking their philosophies out loud instead of showing them through their actions. While it sounds sophisticated, the writing is just dressing up some pretty simple concepts. To illustrate his philosophy, the Merovingian sends an unwitting female patron a thick-ass slice of cum cake. But it's not clear how that demonstrates his point. How does cosbying a woman's food prove that choice is an illusion? Didn't he make the choice to give her the cake which caused the reaction? What were we talking about again? So other than employing all the out-of-work vampires and ghosty ghouls, there's not really much to say about him. When he's not there to cause protracted action sequences, he's just there to be a mouthpiece for the contrasting philosophy to the oracles. Even in Revolutions, all he does is take Neo captive out of spite and then almost immediately get punked into giving him back. He's so obnoxious, in fact, that even his wife Persephone decides to turn on him, helping our hero slay his werewolf bodyguards and free the Keymaker, who gives the Red Pills the inside scoop on the building that contains the source. Trinity will attempt to disable the bomb alarms, Is that a thing? and the Keymaker will take Neo directly to the architect of the Matrix himself. The Architect is introduced in what is simultaneously one of the most important scenes in the films and one of the most infamous scenes in any film. 
There is no worse scene in the history of genre than the architect explaining to Neo everything oh. that happened in the Matrix. That is and I wasn't gonna fucking really... touch that with a 10-foot pole. Most of its ill repute came not from what the architect reveals, but how he reveals it. Ergo! Like the Merovingian, the way his dialogue is written only serves to make it more confusing than necessary. Feast of feast! And yes, you could argue that they're written this way because they're programs, but in this universe we've seen countless examples of programs having personalities and naturalistic speech. Many first-time watchers thought the movie was beyond their comprehension and walked away confused, when a close second viewing is all that's needed to make the rather basic meaning of the content clearer. But don't watch it a third time, because then it'll make even less sense than at first. So we discover that Neo's status as the One is not unique. There have been five other matrices and five other Ones before him. A One arises every so often based on a statistical anomaly in the design of the Matrix, and the machines have learned to incorporate this into their plan. Whenever a One appears, the machines destroy Zion and allow the new One to restart the civilization of humans unplugged from the Matrix. The architect then gives Neo a choice to continue this cycle, or save Trinity and potentially doom everyone still connected. As you adequately put, the problem is choice. The real problem is that the choice is a really easy one. The whole scenario is set up like a grand moral dilemma where Neo must choose between saving his true love or serving the greater good. But that's not really the choice as it's presented to him. The architect gives a lengthy speech that breaks down the machine's entire devious plan of control through giving humans a false choice. It's basically an overly verbose villain monologue, like in all the hackiest of Bond films. But if the machines want Neo to restart Zion and the Matrix like all his predecessors, why expose to him that it's part of their plan? Doing this makes the decision a thousand times easier for Neo, because continuing the machine's planned cycle would be arguably worse than letting everybody die, especially since it's not even clear how saving Trinity would kill everyone still hooked up to the Matrix. So Neo still has hope that he can rescue Trinity and save Zion, a trait that the architect mocks. Since the other choice is like a horror movie scenario, Neo chooses to go save Trinity, because of course he does. He saves her from a perilous fall, but she dies in his arms anyway, leading Neo to go in deep and bring her back to life with Jesus' hands. Apparently his visit with the architect has formed some kind of connection between him and the source, because back in the real world, Neo manages to stop some sentinels dead in their tracks. The strain of this causes him to pass out and wake up in some kind of simulation despite not being plugged in. Smith, on the other hand, has found a way out of the simulation and into the real world. For all its faults, Reloaded is admittedly fun to watch, almost reaching into so bad it's good territory in its goofier moments. By the time we reach Revolutions, though, the fun has been drained dry. What's left is a slog, the feature-length third act of a story that already got its interesting parts out of the way. Sadly, this was the unavoidable result of the Wachowskis' flawed design for the trilogy's structure. The idea is that we're going to make both these movies, Matrix 2 and 3, at the same time, with it's one giant movie. If the program was breaking down and reloaded by revolutions, it is broken. With Neo stuck in a virtual limbo, Agent Smith's power is growing in and outside of the Matrix, making him an exact opposite and negative of the One. Once Neo is freed, Smith strikes on both fronts. He assimilates the Oracle in the Matrix and attacks Neo in the real world, blinding him but finally being thwarted. As the Sentinels descend on Zion, the last humans prepare for a long, long battle. Not even halfway into the movie and it already feels like the finale, only none of our main characters are here. We've spent a combined total of 10 minutes tops with these people and we're supposed to get sobby over their sacrifice. This one scene is actually longer than all their other screen time combined. 19 minutes long, in fact. Almost 20 minutes of metal and dirt that wears on your senses with mind-numbing repetition. It's almost sad to watch the making of this scene because an insane amount of work went into it. Hours upon hours of dedicated labor into producing something that just ends up dull and draining. Ultimately, Zion's forces barely manage to retreat before the next wave of Sentinels, and Neo, realizing that Smith poses an equal danger to the machines as well, travels to the machine city to broker a deal. He will help them stop Smith if they will call a ceasefire on Zion. They agree, setting the stage for the next overextended action set piece. Overconfident after absorbing the Oracle, Smith takes on Neo alone, which is certainly less silly than the Burly Brawl, but no more subtle in its execution, like Dragon Ball Z levels of subtlety. 
That kind of fight scene is almost impossible to pull off in live action, even now, but the 2003 CGI definitely doesn't help. Eventually, Smith emerges victorious, but Neo chooses to keep fighting, which Smith can't understand. He assimilates Neo, but is then destroyed from within, along with all his copies. In exchange, the machines withdraw from Zion, and the film ends on an uneasy piece, with the new Matrix rebooted to the default Windows background. Despite all the philosophizing of the previous movie, Revolutions is comically oversaturated with shooting and punching, but feels more exhausting than exciting. It goes to show that not all action is created equal. The action in the first movie is fast-paced and varied, never feeling like it's dragging, for the most part. Reloaded was pushing it with the 20-plus minute Merovingian chase, but that's broken into distinct sections across different locations, whereas Revolutions is mostly prelude to just two major scenes that drag on and on in a bid to be climactic and epic. But it just makes you tired. So, so tired. So yeah, the Matrix sequels aren't very good. Wow, hot take, I know. Still ragging on these movies might sound like complaining about Justin Bieber. It just feels played out at this point. But we are in 2021, which means we've had enough time for their reputations to be massaged somewhat. Unfortunately, re-watching them and diving back into the world of the Matrix after all these years has only proven that their original reputation was fully warranted. I'll smash this place to bits! See the whole place, like, I'll smash this place to bits! I'll smash this place to bits! I'll smash this place to fucking bits! I'll smash this place to fucking bits! In the first Matrix film, the Wachowskis utilized the choreography and wire work of Yuen Wu Peng along with some impressive camera work of their own to create a hyper-realistic style that truly felt fresh, producing one of the definitive action films of all time. And their dedication to this vision was evident. Hand-to-hand -hand combat is executed flawlessly by actors after months of intensive training with some of Hong Kong's premier professionals. A lot of work that was not necessary by Hollywood standards went into making these fight scenes as believable as possible to help keep the film grounded in a world of computerized mayhem. But for the sequels, it seems they felt obligated to turn it all up to 11. Because once you reach the final fight with Smith, the action has escalated to the point where the style has gone stale. Some serious power creep has crept in, and these godlike beings battling in super exaggerated ways just did not have the same appeal. All the advances that Gaeta has created and his team have created allow the action to just sort of mushroom and get really huge. The first film was full of expertly choreographed fight scenes with real people doing real stunts and occasionally getting really hurt. There was a tangibility to all of it you could feel on screen. By revolutions, it feels like the machines have truly taken over. The other key appeal of the original Matrix, other than its stylistic action, was of course its philosophical subject matter. When the first film released, much was made of this by the media and the fans, insisting that it was steeped in heady postmodern ideas, but any kind of closer look proved that it fell short of its intellectual aspirations. The filmmakers' attempts to fill the sequels with as much existential depth as possible, and the rather clumsy way they did it, only muddled the simple perfection of the original. The primary philosophical influence for the first film, cited by the Wachowskis both on screen and off, was Jean Baudrillard. The story is often told that they had the actors read Simulacra and Simulation before even allowing them to read the script. And in that original script, Morpheus has a line that references the French philosopher by name when he introduces Neo to the desert of the real, saying, As in Baudrillard's vision, your whole life has been spent inside the map, not the territory. But in Baudrillard's vision, there would be no way for anyone, including Morpheus and the other Red Pills, to distinguish between the map and the territory that it was modeled after once this third order of simulation has been reached. And that fundamentally undermines the story of the Matrix, which relies on the distinction of the simulation and the real world for its hook, something that would not be possible in a strictly Baudrillardian story. While they were praised as talented filmmakers, some noted that the Wachowskis may not have totally understood some of the complex concepts they were touting. A number of critics made comments to this effect, including Baudrillard himself, who said the film's references to his work stemmed mostly from misunderstandings. Regarding the sequels, he criticized the architect scene directly and said it would have been more interesting to have the real world and the simulation collide with each other. Now, of course, the Wachowskis could have gone in that direction. 
They could have had the entire world of machines be revealed as yet another simulation, or have the real world become in some way indistinguishable from the Matrix. But they didn't. Probably because they realized that they had just made a groundbreaking film that influenced culture worldwide, and to have a twist in the sequels where you reveal it was all pointless the whole time could have caused a backlash and prematurely tanked any other films they had planned. That's something that works well at the end of one movie, but as a twist in a sequel? It's risky. But they could still try to subvert the first film's simplicity through building the world out more instead of ditching it all. And while it's impossible to know whether or not this was planned from the start, it's hard to believe the criticism didn't impact the way the trilogy played out. Since they couldn't confidently throw the real world into question, it's almost as if you could see them trying to split the difference. We find out that the One and Zion are factored into the machine's plan as a way of keeping the system going. But the war-torn world of the film is still the real world within its universe. The idea that the real world is actually just another simulation is not only nowhere in the film itself, but actively disproved by the Animatrix, where we see the full timeline of humanity's fall to the machines. Sorry, Matrix theorists. The problem is that most of this world building just confuses the original setup of the films with endless unnecessary questions. Why would the machines construct the Matrix this way, where programs can choose to not be deleted? Why constantly send the agents to stop the red-pilled humans when they're trying to do exactly what your plan requires them to do? Have there been other Smiths as well in this cycle? Why is Neo the only one who doesn't love humanity generally, but just loves one person? See what I mean? There's probably a good reason most people who saw these movies remember none of this stuff. It just confuses a story that didn't need it. I can do my cheap Orson Welles imitation and um, <laughs> get paid for it. <laughs> Of course, maybe you love the sequels and thought they were perfectly skilled at navigating all these philosophical issues and building a more fleshed out world. Shit, she's got a fat ass. But there are still some practical and objective reasons for their declining quality in the public consciousness. And these reasons were baked into the design that Wachowskis had for the rest of the trilogy, making the downfall inevitable. The decision to pace and structure the sequels the way they did made it almost impossible for them to be as good as the first film. Reloaded has no real conclusion, and Revolutions is all conclusion. The Wachowskis are not only aware of this criticism, but have combated it by arguing they had intended the sequels to be seen as one long film, rather than two separate films. But imagine if, instead of Reloaded and Revolutions, we actually just got one huge movie, The Matrix, Revoloted. Far from fixing the structural issues of the films, viewing them this way makes the pacing even worse, and the comparison with the original even more glaring. The other fatal oversight to the Matrix sequels was the mystifying decision to shoot two movies and tons of supplemental material simultaneously, then release it all as a flood of content all in one year. Wachowskis apparently wanted the sequels to be released a mere two months apart instead of the six the studio agreed to, which probably would have made the response even worse. This decision also caused the shoot to drag on for almost an entire year, and multiple crew members have acknowledged that it was a grueling experience. It was too much Matrix for anyone to take at once, something the public would feel in May of 2003 when Reloaded was released just a few days after the video game Enter the Matrix, followed by the Animatrix in June and Revolutions in November. The Wachowskis' eyes turned out to be bigger than our collective stomach, and we were force-fed an entire four-course meal with no time to digest. Now, after almost 20 years, certainly enough time for everyone to work up a hunger for tasty weed again, the fourth Matrix film is here, titled The Matrix. Resurrections. Yeah, that's not a good sign. Just a piece of advice from two basement dwellers. If you're writing an installment in a big media franchise and you've narrowed down the subtitle to Resurrection or something similar, throw in the towel, cancel the movie. The series is officially out of ideas. History has proven this. But we'll get to those another day. Given the trailers and hints that have come out, there's been a lot of speculation in the fandom about Resurrections finally fulfilling the series' Baudrillardian potential and presenting the original trilogy as being part of another simulation within the simulation, something they've been eagerly theorizing about for years. But we think the Wachowskis understand something the fans don't. Retconning the entire story of the first film would destroy what millions of people loved about it. At their core, these films are founded on very simple ideas. Our world is a simulation, and the real world is waiting out there for anyone willing to question the system and free their mind. It's robots versus kung fu with metaphysical icing.
And that's okay. Not everything has to be the most finely crafted artisan cum cake in Paris. Sometimes you just want some well-made candy. Why are you here? Same reason. I love candy. And that's okay. okay.